economy. She also works on a million other things uh, and has written for everywhere. I'm, I'm shortening these a little bit, but yeah, is, is on the, is an editor at Jacobin, has written for Descent, M plus one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to my left is Kate Aronoff. Kate Aronoff is a writing fellow at In These Times magazine and a contributing writer for The Intercept, where she covers American politics and the politics of climate change. Uh, Kate previously worked for the New Economy Coalition and is currently pursuing a master's degree in econ at John Jay College of Criminal Justice uh, and has also written for basically everywhere. Um, and all the way to my far left uh, is uh, Michelle Miller. This joke never gets old. Uh, Michelle Miller is the co-founder of coworker.org, a digital platform for worker voice. Since its founding in 2013, coworker.org has supported worker organizing to shift power at companies like Starbucks, REI, Wells Fargo, and Comcast. Um, she is a 2014 Echoing Green Global Fellow, many other fellowships, uh, and yeah, I don't know how much this... Yeah, no, it's a, and it's also written a ton of amazing stuff. So um, I, I won't give to uh, you. Know, you can find longer descriptions of all of our bios, in, including my own, in uh, I think a packet that's circulating. Uh, but without further ado, I think I should hand it off to Alyssa to get us started. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming out. Um, uh, thank you, obviously, to everyone who has put a lot of work into organizing this. It's been really terrific so far, um, and I'm really happy and excited to be on this panel. Um, uh, the second thing I want to say is, you know, of course, happy birthday to Marx, but also thank you to Marx's mother, Henriette Pressburg, who delivered him into the world 200 years and one day ago. Um, uh, so, you know, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> I think their relationship grew strained over the years, but she tried to, uh, uh, you know, it's challenging to be a mother sometimes. Um, and so there, you know, uh, there are clearly, I think, a lot of things that one could say about Marx in relation to capitalism, technology, and ecology. Um, uh, he talks about machinery and automation at length, and his descriptions of machinery can be quite stunning, really. Um, he wrote about agriculture and soil fertility uh, and, of course, the metabolic rift. He was interested in chemistry and physics and the lessons that they held for socialists. Um, he talks about primitive accumulation and the seizure of the commons and the means of subsistence. Um, so there are many, I guess, ways into it. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, these aren't, uh, they're, they're often, they can be conflicting. Um, and I think for many Marxists, it's not been clear what, how to think about the relationship between technology and ecology in particular. Um, is technology a means of liberating humans from the constraints of necessity and eking out a harsh living from, um, you know, an unfriendly nature? Um, or is it a means of dominating nature towards capitalist ends um, that we should, you know, seek to, uh, to, uh, you know, we, should, we shouldn't actually aim for this kind of domination, even of non-human nature. Um, and so I think there are a lot of questions, and you know, I think you could plausibly use Marx to argue different aspects. Um, uh, yes, as of course I just, like, just noted for us, but um, rather than doing some kind of exegesis, I'm going to talk about some questions about what I think about in terms of the relationship of technology, ecology, and capitalism in the contemporary moment. Um, and my approach draws from um, socialist feminist thinkers um, like uh, Donna Haraway, Sylvia Federici, Shulamith Firestone, um, who think about both um, different kinds of labor under capitalism, but also the ways in which technologies um, can be uh, you know, liberatory in, in ways and that, you know, how we can complicate our relationship to nature um, and to capitalism. Um, and so I'm going to think through in particular, um, so I've, I've sort of two things that I want to talk about, but I might only get through one of them. Um, and those are first, uh, so in my work, I tend to think about the place of um, uh, ecosystemic activity under capitalism um, in relation to feminist theories of social reproduction. So. Um, how we think about this kind of background activity that's necessary um, to reproduce life, um, against which the production of commodities occurs. Um, and you know, I think uh, people like John Bellamy Foster, Jason Moore, and others have shown that Marx thought about these things, but they weren't, you know, quite central to his thought. They were certainly not what he spent most of his time thinking about. But um, they are, you know, a significant. Uh, Thing we should think about what is what is the work of a, 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 an ecosystem? How do we think about that in our theories of capitalism? But what I want to talk about is how we think about technologies in relation to that. Technologies of what we might call ecological reproduction, um, 
and whether and how we uh, imagine intervening in the ecosystems that keep our planet habitable. And of course, um, people like uh, Haraway and Firestone in particular have written about reproductive technologies with regard to human bodies and um, how we control our own reproductive systems. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm kind of curious whether and how we think about this in relation to this sort of ecosystemic work. Um, and then if I have time, I might talk a little bit about what kind of modernity we imagine we, we imagine eco-socialism, because I think we sometimes get into this like either Prometheanism, like eco-modernism, sees all, you know, fully automated luxury communism, sees all the machines and have a world of abundance for all through the use of this machinery and technology to produce more and more. Um, or like a just, you know, kind of neo romanticism, um, and I, I would like to not be stuck in those poles. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, whether and how we can imagine a low modernist eco-socialist future. Um, but first, so uh, yeah, so thinking about ecosystemic technologies and the problem of making a living. Um, so uh, when we think about eco-technologies and green tech and clean tech and so on, I think that tends to be, people tend to think about technologies that try to reduce the impact of production um, and that use fewer, particularly non-renewable resources. So you, um, you know, things like solar panels that would substitute um, the use of renewable uh, sunlight instead of um, using coal or oil. Um, and... Uh, or, you know, the electric car or something like that that's supposed to reduce the impact of production on the earth. Um, and, you know, historically, a lot of environmental concern has been premised on the idea that we're going to run out of resources like coal, coal oil, minerals, and so on. Um, and a lot of economists, uh, mainstream economists, will say, well, there aren't really these, like, natural resource limits aren't a real threat to growth because natural resources and man-made ones are substitutable. So um, you can invent technologies that will stand in for uh, natural resources and, and shift production or shift what kinds of um, inputs you're using um, and that these are 100% substitutable. So there's nothing that occurs out in nature that you couldn't figure out like a, another thing that people can either make or find another kind of resource. Um, uh, and so um, that's been a major sort of debate around like a lot of the classic resource scarcity questions. Um, this rarely gets into the question of what about non-renewable resources? Um, can you substitute, you know, uh, for the, re the renewable um, and constantly renewing work of ecosystem activity, um, the kind of ecosystemic activity that's critical to keeping the planet habitable? Um, and this is where the biosphere comes in, finally my PowerPoint. I found a lot, there's like a lot of fun images <laughs> um, throughout this, but starting with the biosphere. So the biosphere is a concept first developed by um, the Soviet scientist, Vladimir Vernadsky, who actually called it the newosphere, but it's the, basically come to, um, we now know this is the biosphere, and it's, um, you know, the layer of the planet that's capable of supporting life, and that's made up of various ecosystemic functions that, um, produce an, an atmosphere and a, a sort of set of systems that, um, in which people and other kinds of species can live. Um, other planets do not, so far as we know, have a biosphere. Uh, it is our one here. Um, and uh, so, um, so that's, that's what the biosphere is. Um, this is ours. <laughs> it's the planet, um, or this layer of the planet. There are many levels of the planet that are not the biosphere, as far as we know. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so I think the question is, um, I'm gonna, and I'm going to be looking at or, or talking a little bit about this example of a, a project that was aiming not to uh, just sort of, you know, curb overconsumption, but to create another biosphere, um, which is uh, Biosphere 2 in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and this is a project um, in the uh, late 80s and early 1990s to build a, uh, an artificial and functional biosphere um, in, yes, in Arizona, <laughs> um, where uh, the idea was to build this closed system um, that people could live in semi-indefinitely, um, living off the food they grew, uh, and uh, you know, they, they had a number of different ecosystems, like a rainforest, a savanna, um, uh, you can see some of them here, marsh, you know, uh, desert, and so on. Um, the lung over here is a nice sort of, <laughs> I mean, they often refer to the sort of biosphere as like the life support system of Earth, but that's often quite literalized in terms of like body parts. Um, but yeah, so they, uh, this is this, this project that was intended to be um, uh, a way to see that if, if an ecosystem was itself something that could be man-made and, uh, you know, um, 
engineered in some way and um, whether people could, could create this, this livable space. Um, and the reason people were doing this um, was it was based off of, inspired by, in, in part, um, these ideas of, of uh, space colonization, um, uh, space settlement, space different, people call it by different terms, and there's been obviously a lot of discussion of whether uh, we should call it even space, uh, living in space colonization, if we should come up with a different term. But this is what, you know, Gerard O'Neill and many others um, did use. Um, anyway, so the biosphere was like, how can we create this kind of, uh, this, in, you know, closed system that we can then launch out into uh, outer space and, and live in. Um, and so, uh, as one of, Jane Pointer, who's one of the scientists on this project, later put it, we needed to know, is life this malleable? Um, is life, you know, something that people can, uh, can shape enough to actually be able to create a, a sort of new system for life? Um, and so, uh, this was the sort of problematic they laid out, how to colonize other planets or survive ecological catastrophe in this one. Uh, so motivated both by this space exploration, but also at, you know, even 25, almost 30 years ago, a sort of anxiety around ecological catastrophe. Um, this is their sort of, they had these little like suits. Yeah, <laughs> they were designed apparently by Marilyn Monroe's dress designer. Um, and obviously are sort of like going on a, you know, neo Star Trek aesthetic, it's pretty nice. Um, <laughs> but what was actually going on, so you know, they have this whole, we're building the biosphere, but it's built on top of a massive technosphere. Um, I kind of compiled some images to create, sorry, I'm pointing at this, I should be pointing at this. Um, but uh, they, um, uh, so Pointer calls this the Garden of Eden on top of an aircraft carrier. Um, and this is the, yeah, huge amount of like technological stuff that they had to um, use to build a set of, you know, artificial systems that would, that, although populated with like actual animals and insects and plants and things like that, still had to like kind of recreate some version of biochemical cycles. Um, and uh, it wasn't quite the Garden of Eden. Um, they lived inside it for two years, grew 80% of their food, uh, lost a lot of weight, um, had a lot of fights, <laughs> lost a lot of <laughs> oxygen, um, uh, and so had a hard time you know, sleeping and breathing and things like that. Eventually they had to pump it. It was supposed to be like completely closed where they were not going to insert any new, um, anything from the outside, but they had to because they were losing so much oxygen. <laughs> um, it was, it was, you know, that or shut it down. The carbon dioxide levels rose very fast, um, and they tried to figure out what to do with that. Um, they tried to sequester carbon by growing plants, um, but then whenever they tilled the soil, the carbon would be re-released. They couldn't really figure out how to stop carbon from accumulating within this closed cycle, yeah. uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the species, like 30 to 40 percent of the species, died off. They were plagued by like ants and cockroaches and you know other kinds of things. After two years, the original crew left the Biosphere 2 on schedule. Um, they were gonna, they were, they were like, oh, we're gonna run this for 100 years and have new crews uh, for 50 new crews for two years each for 100 years. That did not happen. This was the only crew that ever went in, um, and it's been kind of hard to assess like what you know. It's, it was both kind of. Uh, looked at as a stunt that went totally wrong and kind of trashed as a total failure. And then now people are like, well, but we learned something about um, the carbon cycle and so on. We certainly did learn that it's very hard <laughs> to just create a new ecosystem. There's a lot that we don't know how to, that, you know, we don't both understand about how they work, but certainly about how to recreate them. Um, so I think, um, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute, but, um, you know, to be clear, this was definitely not a socialist project or even a governmental one. It was actually run by a company called the Space Biospheres Ventures, um, a company funded by uh, a Texas oil billionaire, um, Edward Bass, who um, actually also funded the <laughs> Bass Library at Yale, where I'm in school. Um, <laughs> so uh, it cost $150 million to build. They imagined it as a profit-making venture. They were going to charge people, well, they did charge people like $13, which now is probably around $25, um, half a million people actually came and saw it and kind of would like walk around looking <laughs> like into the biosphere and um, uh, it was seen as a kind of like big brother type thing. You could like watch the, <laughs> the crews inside interacting and so on. Um, it didn't make any money. Uh, so Bass fired most of the staff while the crew was still inside. There was a huge like mess. Uh, Steve Bannon came in to manage the cost overruns. He was working for like an investment bank and they sent in him to like restructure the finances. <laughs> He eventually, uh, <laughs> um, he eventually brokered a deal with Columbia to take over the lease and the property and like use it as an actual laboratory. 
Um, and, uh, you know, some Truman River sued for back pay. There were a bunch of lawsuits and lots of acrimony. And, you know, so this was definitely a failed capitalist venture that I don't really know what they're, you know, they were like, it's a tourist attraction, but also presumably at some point they would sell this tech to NASA or something. Who knows? Um, so uh, that, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it didn't work out for them. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's the, it's still, of course, a fantasy of capitalists in some way. We now have, um, you know, despite this, you know, kind of failure of, of figuring out how to live on another planet, we now have, you know, our friend Elon Musk saying, well, I'm going to save humanity by colonizing Mars, and um, the only way we can not go extinct here on this planet is to become a space-faring multi-planetary species. Um, he's done this absolutely hideous thing. I, this is like the most cursed image, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> it's so bad. Um, but so, you know, uh, we're going to Mars with like a Tesla car. <laughs> um, but, uh, and you know, last night uh, Anwar Sheikh said it's probably harder to build socialism than to go to Mars. And, um, you know, I think that's probably true, but I think it's probably uh, very hard to live on Mars. Um, and that's actually a question that I think actually is pretty pertinent to socialism in an age of uh, ecological catastrophe. Um, because, you know, what it takes to live on Mars is not that different from, or understanding what it would take to live on Mars is also pertinent to what it will take to live on Earth and how we can um, figure out what, what kinds of, uh, you know, um, how we understand our own planet, like, uh, and and what what kinds of, um, you know, the, yeah, the I think the the kinds of things we would need to to know to to, to actually live on Earth will be quite relevant to how we imagine um, uh, maintaining, regenerating, restoring um, our our own planet, which uh, is going to need quite a lot of that, in my opinion. Um, and you know, of course, it's not. Uh, so this is the the Elon Musk um, colony dream. Um, it's, of course, you know, the, the obvious like rejoinder to that is that um, we have had sort of the socialist daydream on this side too, and Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy is, is, tries to imagine how you could terraform Mars um, in a sort of more utopian way and make it into a livable planet. Um, to be clear, you know, he was recently um, interviewed for the In These Times, and he was, you know, he's very clear that, like, the Elon Musk dream is completely um, absurd. And, and in fact, that, like, I think, you know, this is a scientific or a sci-fi fantasy, like we're, we should not put our eggs in the basket of um, living on Mars um, <laughs> or figuring out how we do that as like the, the safeguard for what we do on Earth. Um, again, I don't think you have to go all the way to, uh, to the, the living on Mars question or to biosphere too, to creating an entirely artificial biosphere to be thinking about the questions of, of how we are um, intervening and in, uh, shaping and trying to, to figure out how we can create um, ecosystems and ecosystemic relationships that we can live with um, on our planet. Um, and I think there are a lot of different versions of this. You know, the, I guess like the lower tech versions are things like rewilding and a lot of ecological restoration projects and building parks and certain kinds of biotech. I think all you can see as potential ways that we are thinking about technology in relation to um, the work of ecological reproduction, which is, I think, you know, one of the most crucial questions for socialists um, in the years to come. Um, and uh, I have talked long enough, so I will leave out my low modernism thing. Well, we can talk about it maybe in the Q&A if people are very excited about that. So, um, yeah, but now I'll turn it over to Kate. Thank you. Kate? Sure. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do if we don't want to live on Mars. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, thematically on, on theme. Um, and thinking about what I, what I was going to say for this, um, kind of like Alyssa, like Alyssa mentioned, there's a lot of sort of inroads into thinking about Marx in relationship to the planet um, and ecology. Um, and, and one thing I think is really useful that comes from Marx is an ability to think about technology as not just some, um, this progression of sort of innovation um, along a, a sort of neutral path that just happens um, as time goes on, um, but, but actually as a product of social relations and um, as, as something which, you know, it, I, I'll use dialectics. Maybe people will yell at me for that. I don't. I haven't. You know, maybe been to enough grad school to use it properly. Um, but um, yeah. But but there's this really interesting interplay between um, humans and technology that we've seen over time, and, and in particular in the history of fossil fuels. Um, that that's something that's come up sort of again and again. So 
um, Timothy Mitchell, um, historian, has done a lot of work on this, um, sort of pointing out kind of how, um, how the, the early history of coal um, coincided um, with sort of demands for things like a shorter work week um, for the abolition of child labor. Um, and that was because the co sort of coal production process lent itself um, to unions, to the growth of trade unions, um, by uh, having people sort of together in, in close proximity. Um, and, and coal transportation sort of relied on the supply chains, um, most, most of which involved trains. Um, and if you have a bunch of Teamsters, it's very easy to shut down a train line um, and, and prevent coal from getting from point A to point B. Um, and so naturally capital was not very happy about, about this. And you know, this isn't necessarily a direct line, I, I, I wouldn't want to say, um, but part of the story of the transition over to oil and how oil became so popular, um, again, this is, this is his, his argument, um, I'm not saying anything terribly new here, um, was that uh, you, you could build pipelines and, and that sort of got rid of the problem of workers sort of getting in the way of fossil fuel um, production and transportation. Um, and so I think that that kind of level of thinking hasn't been, um, I haven't seen it extended as, um, as naturally into solar and wind production and sort of renewables and kind of what is the like labor political economy mm -hmm. um, of, of, of renewable energy. And I'm not actually going to talk too much about that. Um, but all it's to say is that um, I think that uh, renewable energy and sort of the process of decarbonization of, of making sure that our productive, policy, uh, productive processes aren't as bound up in um, toxic supply chains, um, that, that is often framed as a technical question, right? And so um, considering that sort of an earnest being sort of earnest um, historical materialist in the 21st century um, means looking at kind of the full range of, um, of what fuel of what fuels sort of society um, in, in, a, in a broad um, sense of the word. I mean, Andreas Malm sort of points out um, that, that the English language, I think, is the only, the only language maybe where, where pow the words for power um, mean, uh, mean many different things. So power is in political power, um, power is in kind of what turns the lights on, um, and, and those two things are not, you know, that's not necessarily a coincidence. And so what I want to talk about is, is kind of, as we're thinking about um, this really urgent problem of decarbonization. How do we, um, how do we transition off of fossil fuels um, and our sort of near complete dependence on them right now? Um, what else needs to be considered? And so I'm a reporter. I, I end up looking a lot at climate policy. Um, and so there's been sort of various waves of, of what's kind of in vogue in climate policy. Um, and so a few years ago, that was cap and trade. Now the sort of center left demand seems to be around 100% um, renewable energy and getting to 100% renewable energy. There was a bill introduced, I think last year by um, Bernie Sanders and I think it was San Sanders, um, a s crew of sort of progressive um, legislators, legislators on Capitol Hill. Um, and, and there have been versions of this at, in state legislatures um, and elsewhere. Um, and that really doesn't, it's true right, like that we need 100% renewable energy, um, but there are all these sort of other implications of what, um, of what decarbonization means that, that don't get sort of included in that picture. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, what does that picture look like and argue um, that, that part of what that is is a rethinking of the welfare state um, and how we, how we sort of apportion benefits and think of the role of the state um, in, um, in people's lives and in, in the economy. Um, and, uh, and, and looking at, you know, what does the fight over that look like and, and what does the fight to build a, a good life um, look like in some ways that are not um, necessarily thought of as, as climate demands, um, but I think are politically important to think about um, as, we're, as we're thinking about, you know, the huge um, technical task on the one hand, but also the huge political task of just um, creating the sort of will um, for this level of massive um, transformation transformational change to the economy um, in uh, the next, you know, now. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of spend the rest of the time just talking about, you know, what are, what are these, these other pieces of decarbonization which we don't, which we don't talk about, um, which brings me to um, striking teachers in um, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Oklahoma in particular. Um, I have not followed Arizona quite as closely, um, and so I'm not going to pretend to talk about that, and, and as you might see, it doesn't sort of fit as well into um, the story that I, I want to tell, but um, 
with regards to West Virginia, Kentucky, and Oklahoma, um, it's really, I don't think, a coincidence that, that all three of these strikes occurred um, in states whose economies have historically relied almost entirely, um, or at least very, very heavily, around fossil fuels. So West Virginia and Kentucky um, were um, both built, uh, Eastern Kentucky in particular, um, their economies have both been built um, basically from the ground up around around fossil fuels and around in Kentucky, um, in Kentucky and West Virginia in particular, coal. Um, coal over the last several years um, has declined as, as the natural gas boom has taken off. Um, and that's devastated, um, devastated the economies of, of West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, and so um, part of having a, a basically a petro state is that you have very friendly tax policies um, toward um, toward coal companies and toward, you know, there, there is a little bit of natural gas in West Virginia. There's not very much in Kentucky. Um, we'll talk about Oklahoma in a little bit, which is sort of a wasteland of, of pro-industry policy. Um, but uh, this, this sort of, um, the, the, coal, the decline of coal um, has sort of cratered the tax base of, um, of, of, of these states. And so this is kind of what teachers are responding to in a way, um, that there simply isn't as much money as there used to be um, in the states to fund um, the public sphere. And so there's this big question there of um, how do you fund a public sphere um, in a place where that has historically been the job of um, the fossil fuel industry. Um, and you know, there are various proposals sort of on the table in both of those states. Um, the idea has been, been, been discussed of a permanent fund um, in, in the mold of Alaska. Um, actually, in, after the oil crisis, um, many, many states um, around the country that are resource intensive um, created their own permanent funds. Um, North Dakota actually created one at the start of the fracking boom, um, and its education spending, um, I think, what grew by the most of any state in the union um, since 2011. Um, while Oklahoma, which does have a, still has a lot of a lot of fossil fuels, um, declined uh, by I think the most the most of any state in the union, um, basically by virtue of you know these these states are not kind of using um, what what kind of resource wealth they have. Um, for the benefit of, um, of of the people in their states, but but almost all of those profits go to um, go to these these fossil fuel corporations, and so um, it's been very easy in these places to make um, for the right to make a political argument that um, you know there is a trade-off to be made between um, between getting rid of fossil fuels and jobs, um, and that that is a direct sort of economic um, choice that has to be made. And the left's answer to that, and, and the green sort of left in particular, has been, well, no, it won't. Um, and <laughs> there, there hasn't really been a sort of way to, way to really counter that and, and articulate kind of what a good life looks like um, that doesn't involve fossil fuels. And I think that's not, you know, that's not as, as, as sort of um, talked about kind of in the, um, in, in sort of the green circles that I've, in climate circles that, that I've been a part of. Um, but I think is really crucial, particularly in those places um, whose economies have been dependent um, on these resources, to say, um, to, to really put forth a vision of, of what a low carbon life can look like, um, and what a low carbon state can look like, and what a low carbon welfare state can look like. Um, and that is really challenging, I think, in part because some of our models um, that we, we often look to for social democracy up through um, you know, socialism um, have been petro states. If you look at Scandinavian mm -hmm. social democracies, um, much of that wealth comes from um, the sort of accumulated wealth of, of oil, um, particularly oil in, in places like Norway, um, less so in Sweden. Um, and I won't claim to be an expert on that, but I think the, the, model, the existing models we have don't fully reckon with um, the fact that, um, that, that our, our models for building, um, building robust welfare states often do involve, um, often do involve um, really sort of toxic um, toxic supply chains. Um, and so, you know, in, in thinking about decarbonization and, and what it looks like to muster the political will, um, the left really does need to, to be sort of um, proactively thinking about what that what that looks like. Um, and I'll talk, I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> I wasn't I'm, even measuring. Okay, okay great. Yeah, um, so I wanna, I wanna talk, um, well, just just to sort of like wrap up that point, um, I think we should really be thankful, be thanking teachers in um, in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Oklahoma for these strikes, which are really you know 
I, teachers I've, I've, I've talked to, um, I don't think would necessarily articulate it this way, um, but it really is a fight to define what a, what a low carbon world um, right. looks like. Um, and, and the austerity, the fight against austerity is, is crucial um, to that, um, because austerity is really a, a horrible way to respond to any um, sort of disaster, which brings me to um, Puerto Rico, um, where teachers were also on strike um, this past week. Um, and I won't, maybe, maybe later we can get into the sort of whole history um, of, of why um, Puerto Rico is in the situation that it is, starting with colonialism, um, but, and, and, you know, continuing with colonialism. Um, but um, what, the, what the government there has done is essentially, um, and, and the fiscal control board, the sort of Washington appointed body, um, they've responded to a massive um, unnatural disaster, I would say, um, Hurricane Maria, um, by trying to insert more austerity um, and less spending into, into the picture, um, which might be kind of the opposite of what you can do to recover from um, not just a storm, but also the kind of um, recession and depression, which has um, plagued Puerto Rico's economy for a long time. Um, and so there's a way in which like the set of tools that politicians are working with um, sort of across the board, both in, in places where, um, where the state has relied on extraction um, and places that are actually dealing with climate impacts um, are just totally sort of ill-equipped um, to deal with you know, any, any sort of the picture of decarbonization and kind of what the 21st century um, will look like, which for many places will mean more climate disasters, will mean more sort of destruction. Um, and so in thinking about you know, what a, a holistic picture um, for decarbonization looks like, that um, I think just involves many, many more questions than um, how do we get to 100% um, renewable energy. Um, and yeah, I could, I could lift off more things, but I won't. And uh, we'll give, give the time elsewhere. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, this morning uh, when I was trying to think about what I was going to say and if I was going to be able to say it in like a sort of linear manner, um, I started thinking about this piece that I read um, back in December by the science fiction writer Ted Chang, who was reacting to the sudden dire warnings from people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates about the coming AI like robot apocalypse that's going to take us all over and do terrible things to us. And Ted Chang's position in the piece was essentially like, well, yeah, if it acts like you, but it doesn't have to. Um, <laughs> And he, you know, he really talked about it as like, the reason that they're scared of AI is because they think AI is going to act like capitalism, and it doesn't actually have to do that. Um, and he said, I mean, who else pursues goals with a monomaniacal focus oblivious to the possibility of negative outcomes? Who adopts a scorched earth approach to increasing market share? You. So, um, so what, what I loved about that was that it did really reframe these questions that we have about the growing power that um, artificial intelligence and algorithms and technology has in our economy to something that has the potential to actually be in our hands and to do really great things for us. Um, but that currently the growth of technology is actually based on the logic of resource extraction. Um, there's a lot of reason why if you um, read, you know, a bunch, like, a lot of economists right now talk about like um, data is the new oil that um, that a lot of the investment that most technology companies are getting is not in the production of product or not in the creation of innovation or new things but actually finding really new clever ways to get your data from you and there's a huge speculation economy built on what we might be able to do with that data someday Shoshana Zuboff explains this um, in um, a lot of the work that she's done on the idea of surveillance capitalism, that it started with tech platforms like Google and Facebook that perfected the art of taking your data and using it to sell you ads. And now they've actually figured out how to take those mechanisms that were just about data extraction for ad sales and to start to apply them uh, to creating artificially intelligent systems that both um, can s sort of self-perpetuate but also um, continue to think of even more clever ways to get your data to sell you ads and then also build technology that will, do th that will automate all of the things in our lives. Um, and so I think a lot about that in the context of worker organizing because while it's hard and sort of amorphous um, in the use of consumer platforms like Google and, and the ways in which we in our regular lives interact with these platforms, when you are at work, 
you actually have an economic relationship with the technology that you're using and with the power that is implementing that technology on your life. And so is the workplace and is worker organizing a place to start contesting the power of these extractive technologies and to reclaim them um, for the commons and for ourselves? Um, and so that's a little bit of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I built uh, an organization about five years ago that um, essentially says if we can use platforms to aggregate people to do work, then could we use platforms to aggregate them to contest power at work? If we can use the network's effects of Facebook to create, you know, communities to, to send ads and to, um, and to do all kinds of other things, can those communities be communities of workers who start to actually like function as workers of the world, not just workers of a nation state or workers of a single entity? Um, and so I, I have a lot of faith in the repurposing of the technology um, in order to contest that power, but we, we have to start thinking about the ways that um, companies make money and the ways that they are building their own power as not that they're you know, creating a bunch of products or technological innovations that we want to use, but that they're hoarding a commodity of ours, which is data. Um, and so I, um, uh, like a year or two ago, I started thinking about the ways in which um, data extraction um, and, and algorithmic manipulation take place inside the workplace um, in ways that we could build a labor movement that's able to respond to that and return some of the productivity to workers from that. So one very simple example is the use of productivity trackers. Um, they you know, they uh, watch people who work in Amazon work warehouses or people who even like white collar workers at their desks and they um, determine you know, how many steps it took you to get from like thing A to thing B um, and they either, well they never really reward you, I mean they just like pay you or they dock you for like not meeting the metrics that are set. Um, and in that case, like, there's the, the sort of blatant exploitation of managing a person by a robot that sets artificially high standards for performance and then penalizes people for not meeting them. But there is also the fact that all of those systems are built on data that workers are contributing to it as they are performing those tasks um, that are actually telling it what the bare minimum should be, and they are not compensated for any of the value of that data. And so if we even just started in those very simple ways of working um, with groups of workers to start to demand that they get a share of the productivity increases that result from them being managed by these systems that are run on data that they contribute in the first place, like is that a place to start to frame create a framework where we can put value on the amount of data that's being extracted from systems, um, from people. And um, in, a, in a sort of creepier instance of this, there are a lot of, um, this is more in the white collar sector, um, but uh, there's a lot of use of behavioral analytics software to mine you psychologically and categorize you and surveil your behavior in order to more effectively manage you. It is often positioned as, um, uh, a means to find high performers and reward them. Um, or hidden influencers, which is like my favorite phrase because that just means organizers. Um, uh, and again, like this is, this is a system that uh, in the short term makes it possible for employers to start to not to share common gains with the commons of the workforce, but to select certain people based on their data profile for, um, so if you have a profile that says you are a flight risk and you might quit sometime, they're much more likely to give you a raise than someone who isn't a flight risk because maybe they're a single mother or maybe because they're a person of color, they have less job market mobility because hiring is racist. And so it like sort of reinforces hierarchies um, around social exclusion. It also um, allows for employers to be much more selective about the ways that gains in productivity get shared across workforces. And so again, if we can think about ways in which workers are demanding access to that data, that we start to treat that data as a commons, as a common resource, um, instead of something that is tied up and held by a few owners, those are the places where we can start to then apply that shared knowledge to building technological systems that work for everyone and aren't built on this um, basis of extraction. And I, I think a lot about this also because I think in our like, in like fever dream fantasies, um, post-revolution we like get all of the platforms and all of the systems and then we use them for our purposes, but like they are built 
on exploit exploitation. Like, I don't want Amazon. It's, it ain't good. Um, and so um, some of the other work that we need to do in the long term is to really start thinking about the ways in which we would repurpose and rebuild or like start from scratch the same kinds of platform and networking technologies that have been used to create monopolies and to um, create domination in order to create more of a global commons. Um, and to do it from a perspective that isn't rooted in this idea of extraction, um, but in an, in an idea of abundance and an idea of a commons. So. Still taking notes from you. Uh, yes, I should. Uh, I should put my little thing up. Hold on one second. I might actually do it from over here because when I didn't realize it would be set up like this, which I should have. Do do do. Play. All right. Um, actually, I'll skip right to the next one. Um, so. Actually, looking at, I, I know a few people here have heard me talk about some of these things before. This is uh, a couple of like lessons or ideas from a much larger project that includes like all the political theory classics, including like you know what are states and do we need them and uh, like what could a political subject be for today. Um, but what I want to talk about here, sort of briefly, are a couple paradoxes. Um, and the sort of difficulty of the situation. I'm um, actually, you know, I guess it's fallen to me to do the like super dismal part of almost every ecological panel uh, that ever happens, uh, which is like it's worse than you imagine. Um, the chart you have up here to your left is the um, parts per million of atmospheric carbon from 1960 until April 29th, 2018. One other thing that's real charming about working on climate change is that you can literally update your data every week and it's always worse um, and one of the things that uh, you know I'm not gonna like bury you in these fucking horror stories but um, one of the things that's really interesting that I, uh, one reason I wanted to start with this chart in particular is that uh, there can be a tendency to treat climate change uh, and global warming as a sort of add-on like, and as a policy thing, like, oh, we'll just tweak that down, like 10% less carbon next year, it'll be good. Um, uh, Kate mentioned cap and trade, um, even sort of um, some of like uh, carbon tax positions, things like that. Um, it's not that simple. Um, you know, the very famous, you know, people were really aghast when uh, Trump uh, removed his signature from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, a treaty that was not worth the paper it was written on, not simply in terms of political enforcement, but literally its own goals had been failed three years previous to its signing. Um, like it, uh, as this sort of curve goes up, you can't just nibble it down. Like if next year there was zero carbon emissions, that shit would still go up and it wouldn't actually start going down for like hundreds, maybe even longer years. So it's not, right, these are these sort of cascading effects. It's not simply something you can tweak away. On the right hand side of this is, um, th this is a fun little one too. Um, it was recently uh, 50 degrees Celsius uh, in this small town in uh, Pakistan, uh, Nawab Shah, which is near uh, 100 miles away from Karachi, which was not only the hottest day uh, in April this year, but in fact the hottest day in April ever in all of recorded human temperature on Earth. Um, it was about, that's a, and that's about 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that is actually a pot hotter than you can live. Like if you're just like walking around, like you will die pretty quickly. Um, and what's interesting about this is not only just like, oh man, that's a really terrible horror story, um, but tons of people. This is like an area that's heavily populated, right? So if you're thinking about this, not only in terms of, uh, of just these sort of like raw data about ecologies, but about social systems, I mean, that's a lot of people who are gonna have to move or die um, in the way the world is arrayed, arranged right now. That is a really brutal reality that I think very few people are sort of prepared to deal with. So, okay, that's the downer stuff. It's actually a lot of downer stuff, I'm sorry. Um, one thing that's super, super interesting, at least to me, um, 
And you know, uh, you know, Alyssa mentioned a little bit that you know there are this sort of like techno optimist literature. You can sort of like build your way out of the problem. And there is like a large sort of mainstream literature that is sort of yeah, we can tweak our way out of the problem. Um, but there is a broad range and like a weird sort of convergence among super disparate perspectives when people start digging into the natural scientific data on this problem. Like oh shit, there are some real problems. So um, what I have up here on the left is probably the least famous book. Um, this is this obscure business school text uh, written in Australia by two business school professors. Starts like chapter one, like it's like a Paul Samuelson classic, Econ 101. By like chapter five, they're Rosa Luxemburg, and by chapter nine, they're John Bellamy Foster because they start digging into this problem and realizing that they cannot live in a growth-based economy anymore. Um, there's lots of different solutions across this uh, spectrum of books I've put up here, um, but one thing that they all agree on is we have to change our relationship to production and our relationship to growth. Um, next to it is Kate Raworth's book. This is a sort of pop economics book. Uh, it's actually really quite brilliant. I, I highly recommend it. Um, but again, she and you know she comes and and convenes around uh, an idea of a steady state economy and d getting off of growth and productivity for a different you know not abandoning development. This is not primitivism, um, but rather thinking about development differently, doing it differently. And on the right, we are at a Marx conference. These are, the, are some of the most famous Marxian takes on the question. Um, and it's funny, I know Andres Malm and Jason Moore don't think they agree on lots of things, but I actually think they do. Guys, if you're watching, it's cool. Um, but, what? <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I teach these books together, and uh, all my students like see them as extremely complimentary. Um, but the the thing that's really, really, really important um, is that bringing a Marxian perspective um, can. Uh, can be both challenging and quite uh, illuminating to this question. And the first big challenge, though, is that we can't, right, right, you can't, again, you can't do the add on. Just like you can't do the liberal add on, you can't do the wave the full communism wand. Like, oh, full communism and the world gets better. Um, it doesn't solve this problem in the current way we think about production. Okay, so. This is a very recent article. I'm just giving you the like abstract. You don't, I'm not going to read it. You can read it. And uh, you can find this online. I, pff, it's probably paywalled. But um, uh, it's from Nature. You know, it's the Nature family of journals. This is the specific Nature Sustainability. Um, it's a team of uh, ecologists and uh, economists. And they're sort of measuring what they call um, a good life for all within planetary boundaries. And it's not the like prettiest picture of all time. Um, they do think, in fact, we can get to things uh, that are, you know, housing, food, clothing, basic necessities for all people without like a die off. We'll talk about die off in a little bit. Um, without like a die off with current uh, production capacities. Um, and curving things to stay within what they call planetary boundaries, meaning within livable uh, carbon ranges um, and using uh, resources at a rate that doesn't deplete them. Um, it's a, there's a lot more in there, but I'm trying to move quickly. Um, however, they say high quality of life uh, things, and in this they list things like living in a democracy. They also list things like having uh, 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 in educational infrastructure, things like this. Um, these are too expensive. Um, as they say, you can see right here, two to six times more expensive than the uh, sustainable level. So here is, but they are using, and I, I think it's incumbent upon uh, Marxian thinkers, left thinkers more broadly, to take this literature seriously, even though it's about to, it doesn't do what I'm about to say, because these are people who are really trying to measure the actual amounts of stuff, and this planetary, uh, they, there's always been like a fear in Marxist circles of like Malthus, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but like this stuff's real, like there's only a certain amount of cadmium in the world. You can't just m make more of it like, like out of a replicator, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and why do I pick on cadmium? Because cadmium's the thing that makes your phone run. Um, so, that said, this kind of literature assumes a couple things. One, that, this, that these costs are static, right? Um, that there's basically, it costs as much as markets deliver them for. There's only one kind of market. Last night, you know, there was some discussion of you know, market capitalism, market socialism. Uh, this assumes markets as one kind of thing, that's it. Uh, it also assumes there's only one kind of state. Um, 
it's something I'm, I'm definitely going to want to talk about more. I mean, that Tim Mitchell book is so good because it also talks about the creation of other kinds of states. Like, why do we have states like Saudi Arabia, which are super weird, is part of that story as well. There's lots of different kinds of states. This assumes there's only one kind of state and that it delivers things at this cost. And this is where I think a Marxian perspective is key. Um, this is an artificially inflated price for these high quality of life goods. Um, and we're going to have to start thinking uh, in this space uh, not only about sort of communal luxury, this is a wonderful book by uh, Kristen Ross, came out a couple years ago about the Paris Commune, but uh, an old, a very old Marxist dream, also frankly an old Keynesian dream, an old even Adam Smithian dream, that temporal luxury, having more time, um, slowing down production, slowing down growth might be something we actually want democratically, we actually want as a political project. Um, a few of you will have heard me do this before. This is a thought experiment I like to do uh, when I'm giving these talks, uh, just to sort of underline both the difficulties and some of, and some of the possibilities. So uh, I call it thinking a surplus squeeze through a cyborg circuit. Anyone who uh, is list sort of, if your bells are going off, obviously this is a Donna Haraway inspired uh, thought experiment, especially her early work. Um, but think about this like imaginary circuit, okay? Um, you can start anywhere you like. So increased atmospheric carbon contributes to ocean temperatures rising, contributes to depletion of livelihood, and this is just one little circuit, um, for nearly one million Filipino fishermen, uh, fishing families rather, whose labor is then double shifted along mostly gendered lines uh, onto both migrant laborers uh, uh, working in petrostates in the Gulf and care workers in the United States and the EU. Um, uh, 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 freeing up hyper-employed labor in advanced states to increase productivity, which in turn demands more petroenergy and more chemical inputs. Um, as you can see, this is a pretty vicious cycle. The, but the other thing you have to note on here, right, is, is that one of the other tendencies in the literature is to try to split off um, or, or think of ecological problems um, without dealing sometimes with the social ramifications. But if you sort of look along this um, chain, right, you can see A, what sort of classic Marxist thinking, especially someone like Rosa Luxemburg, would see as both the sort of primitive accumulation, sites of primitive accumulation, and also sites of surplus value across everywhere, right? Um, two, uh, and I actually didn't put this up here, right, everywhere along here is also a political and social crisis. Right? There's, a, there's a crisis of gendered labor here. There's a crisis of po politics here. Right? If you think about the current politics of the United States, where I'm imagining our, our, our advanced sort of hyper-employed worker lives, or you think about the Philippines, where I'm imagining, not really imagining, where these fishing families live, um, these are both now run by wannabe sort of right-wing hardcore authoritarians or, honest to God, right-wing authoritarians. Um, those things are, are inextricable. So if you aren't dealing with the political and social problems, you're actually going to fail in your challenge of dealing with the ecological ones. Two, thinking back to the slide before, these costs are not quality of life costs per se. Um, it's because we have to keep these things profitable, because we have to keep them private, and because we are wanting uh, accumulation and growth that keeps this little cycle running. Um, and it sort of, yeah, that, my last point I've already hit. It, it's impossible to imagine how to unravel. Uh, it's, it becomes clear how impossible it is to unravel the social from the ecological in these crises. So my key example for today is the paradox of renewable energy. So when you like read about renewable energy in, I don't know, like super mainstream publications, I don't know, New York Times, Newsweek, Wall Street Journal, whatever, um, usually the problems are framed as technological. Right? It's like inefficient turbines or the photovoltaic cells won't give us enough power. Um, there's insufficient storage capacity. Batteries are often talked about, uh, capacitors, things like that. Um, but the really weird thing about this is virtually all of these technological problems have been surpassed or are pretty close. Um, the really, really sort of like funny bit of it, this actually jibes a lot with the biosphere story. Um, a lot of this research was done by BP, ExxonMobil, in the early 2000s. Uh, they found the stuff worked like a charm. It's fucking fantastic. Um, there is a problem with that. Um, it's uh, the sort of classic name in sort of old economics literature, old political economy literature for this is a Lauderdale paradox, which is that as 
things get super cheap and super efficient and are incredibly abundant, it's impossible to make money off them. Um, so like, we don't actually lack the capabilities to have these technologies. We lack the political will to implement them. So, and this brings me on my final highly contentious slide. Um, so thus, while there are real planetary boundaries, our lodestar should be Marx and not Malthus, right? There are planetary boundaries, but this is about social relations. It's more about systemic stability and stressors than it is about running out of things altogether. Um, the shift from growth-based development to sustainable redistributive development is a problem of social relations and it is necessary. And then I have here like this list, and I'll, I will go through it real quickly, of sort of everyone's dream and misconception about this problem. Um, like mainstream liberal policymakers, there is no market-based solution for this problem. There just is none. Anyone who tells you there's a market-based solution for climate crisis is lying to you. Two, uh, Marxists, uh, sorry folks, uh, we can't wait for the revolution or the withering of the state. Um, again, uh, it's proven, you know, the, the joke about uh, it's really hard to uh, colonize Mars, right? Uh, it's also proven pretty hard to, like, have the world revolution. I don't know if people have noticed that. Um, and this problem, that, like, first chart, that, that goes up every single year. It doesn't stop. Um, so we can't raid around for this, and, and I'll get to the state again in a moment. There's also sort of a techno-futurist, techno-optimist, the Elon Musks. Um, there is a sort of left version of this as well. Uh, but, you know, we want you, what we want is to build ourselves into a future of shared temporal luxury, not continuous growth. This does not mean like asceticism. I am like the most anti-aesthetic person ever, but actually we already live with a lot of technologies and a lot of subjectivities that appreciate things that actually are extremely low cost. Most of the stuff that uh, even like so-called advanced developed, you know, subjectivities and tastes want now is like very easily and cheaply produced. The stuff that's really expensive, frankly, is fossil fuel-based energy, air travel. Uh, there's a couple, you can go down a list, I have charts and other things. But like, th that's the world of slowing down. It doesn't mean like living with hair suits and like eating turnips all the time. Um, and finally, that brings me to anarchism. Um, you know, I think there's an, an interesting debate between a lot of anarchists uh, who rightly criticize a lot of sort of super, um, super excited and exuberant um, communists uh, say, uh, for saying like, look, come on guys, there's not enough stuff, it's not gonna work, it's unsustainable. But at the same time, any sort of feasible, real term, uh, steady state or planned degrowth economy is exactly that, it is planned. And what does that mean? It means that it has a state. It means there's a state of some kind is there, and not just sovereign states, and I do mean sovereign here and all that ugly word, and that's why I've got our old friend Thomas up there. But um, probably international bodies, those ugly things, treaty organizations, um, and, you know, these will likely be necessary for any non-die-off based climate change scenario. And I will say I've, there's a, a growing body of sort of, of uh, kind of primitivist literature um, that talks about, you know, sort of the, uh, uh, the challenges of the Anthropocene, they're all almost die, they're almost all die up scenarios. And if you think about which six billion people are gonna die off in the die off scenario, I know which six, six billion. Uh, that's the Rex Tillerson position, I have to say, right? He knows everything I've said in this thing, like someone like that. He, but he knows he's gonna be safe. There, uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti made this claim, there's no lifeboats. Nah, that's not true. Rex Tillerson has a lifeboat. Uh, there are winners in the climate change scenario. Uh, just most of us aren't in the category. So that is, I'll stop there. Like I said, it's part of a bigger project, but uh, that's all I have to say. Okay. So I'll transition from talking to asking. Um, I think I'm going to do almost the opposite of what last night, you know, we had our opening panel and I tried to sort of stitch everyone together. Um, I almost want to ask you all ever so slightly different questions, um, if you don't mind. And then we should, uh, and then if you have also questions for each other, please. Um, and actually, Kate, uh, I actually think I want to start with you because I want to hear more 
um, you were talking about Petros. I mean, you, clearly I, I, it caught my ear because I was like, yes. I also love the, Tim Mitchell's book. On, uh, it's like the most accidentally Marxist book of all time. You know, he doesn't consider it a Marxist yeah. book, but it's like literally like, this is how you form a proletariat. Um, but I would love to hear more about it because you stopped right before you're talking about Puerto Rico and you yeah. stopped right and, and he does have so much to say about the formation of post-colonial states and I just want to hear a little bit more about the story of colonialism in this conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I um, actually just, I was on a reporting trip in Puerto Rico um, this, this past week and so it's kind of on my mind so I think I'll talk, I'll focus mostly on, on Puerto Rico and not pretend to Go be a, a, a scholar of post-colonialism. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, Puerto Rico is a really interesting um, place to think through these questions, in part because there really aren't fossil fuels there. Um, so like, um, like most island, um, island nations, Puerto Rico is, is, is heavily dependent on oil. Um, they get, they've gotten upwards of 90% of their um, fuel from oil for most of the, the 20th century. Um, there's a little bit of coal, um, very, very little bit of renewables. Um, and kind of what has happened in the last couple of years is I think kind of goes back to something Michelle was talking about, um, is that when there isn't, um, a, when there aren't sort of fossil fuels to extract, there are you know, new sort of frontiers that, that the logic of extraction um, that fuels capitalism and has fueled sort of um, empire for a long time sort of seek out new, um, new venues. And so in, in Puerto Rico, that has been um, sort of financial extraction um, mm -hmm. for a long time. And so um, for um, much of the 20th century, um, uh, after Puerto Rico became a territory, um, was treated as sort of a tax haven um, for corporations. And so there were these very generous federal tax breaks, um, which expired in 2006 um, and plunged the economy into a very, very deep recession that it's still in. Um, and so uh, almost overnight, um, unemployment skyrocketed, um, the bond rating for Puerto Rico um, plummeted, and uh, in steps uh, Wall Street and says, um, we will negotiate these, these forms um, as forms of lending, which will let you exceed your borrowing limit, um, which will let you take out more bonds, um, and uh, will you know, basically let you rewrite, um, rewrite sort of financial regulations. Uh, and so um, Wall Street banks, um, uh, most of the big players, Citibank is big in this, um, Santander, um, I think Goldman, Goldman Sachs is a, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact names of the banks, um, but sort of the big players, you know, who, who you would think of um, as, as being these folks, um, step in sort of after the financial crisis, um, at, at, like sort of compounds the, the ongoing recession in Puerto Rico, um, and engineer these, these forms of debt which are probably illegal. Um, there hasn't been an audit of the debt, that kind of um, was a big demand before Hurricane Maria hit, and, and um, very quickly, um, the, the sort of ruling government in Puerto Rico um, uh, s stopped any audit of the debt that, that was, was likely to be put on the table. Um, but Wall Street steps in, um, makes most of its money actually underwriting bonds um, to US-based hedge funds um, and mutual funds. There's some other players in there too, um, but drives the country into 74 billion dollars in, in debt. I think, I think I'm getting the billion right um, there. Um, and including on things like PREPA, on um, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, um, which is this sort of actually holdover from the New Deal, um, uh, a public utility corporation, um, which, which um, has sort of remarkable reach um, in, in the sort of um, landscape of, of um, island, um, island power utilities. Basically everywhere is electrified. Um, the infrastructure is um, aged. It's, you know, in some cases very, you know, has not been updated since the 1950s, um, but is really sort of um, wide ranging in, in terms of how, how far it reaches into um, many parts of the island, including places that are hard to, hard to access. And so there's a sort of like horrible, um, I mean, Christian Parenti uses this term, the sort of catastrophic convergence, and it's maybe a version of that, um, which is, you know, basically like all these things sort of come together at once. And so um, there, when, when Hurricane Maria hits, there have already been like successive hurricanes that have hit Puerto Rico, right? There's colonialism um, going back hundreds of years. Um, there's a sort of financial, um, you know, vulture funds that have come in, um, various just sort of taking and taking and taking and taking. And so um, the storm comes in and then uh, it's just that the island is, is and the 
governing structures sort of overseeing the island are, are totally unable to respond. Um, and so this sort of goes back, um, you know, it's, it's hard to like look at any one origin point for this, right? It like keeps sort of going back. Um, and so I think the, the, there's this sort of way that like extraction is so, um, is so deeply embedded into a colonial project and sort of the worst, um, you know, you see the worst impacts in places that are like Puerto Rico is a colony. Um, and so um, it just so happens um, that many of the places that are uh, most likely to be worst hit by climate change are already being worst hit by climate change, um, are either, you know, in colonial relationships like Puerto Rico, are post-colonial states or places that have had resources sort of just taken from them historically um, and, and been um, really stopped from um, developing in ways that would be resilient to um, climate change. There's much more to say about that. No, but <laughs> I mean, the, 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 it, 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 I mean, it's not, uh, nothing on this is like particularly like uplifting. Um, but as I was gonna say, it's like, it's the perfect sort of setup in some ways, because the, one of the, key, there is a threat, right, running through, I think, every, what everyone's talking about here. And I'm thinking in particular, of Michelle, of what you were talking about, of extraction, and, and how you make sites for extraction, and colonization is one of those things. Um, but uh, Michelle, I wanted to give you a chance, because uh, it seemed like you wanted to, like, there was a connection, right? There's resource extraction, there's data extraction. Uh, and I think this colonial relationship might be illuminating, or I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I, I was thinking um, when you were talking about um, West Virginia as also a source of resource extraction, um, I grew up there. My whole family's still there. Uh, I'm very connected. Um, and I think a lot about the ways in which um, I think that the reason I'm sort of obsessed with making claims on the wealth generated by, from data extraction is that I grew up in a place where like, we made no claims on the wealth generated from our resource extraction. We had a union that made wage claims on some income shares, but not on wealth. And so I, I think that like, if we can really start thinking about, I think you're right that like, um, when all of the all of the hard natural resources are extracted, then capital just figures out another way to like keep taking and taking and not giving back, um, and that we have to be really thoughtful about um, when we're making demands that we're not making demands on like the profit of the long term pro the pr the end product of the extraction, but the like the methodologies of the extraction and like what are the uh, what is the other wealth generated from the systems that are built to pool whatever those resources are and whatever. And um, if you look at the like, um, the ways in which t technology, uh, okay, so um, what we see of tech and specifically artificial intelligence is like kind of like uh, just this magical process. But in many post-colonial places around the world, there are these large farms of people who are working day in and day out on computers to actually make, they're performing the labor of that magic. Um, so like you type a thing in that you're finding and you think that the machine like went and found it for you But actually there's someone in the Philippines or in sub-saharan Africa or in India Who's going and looking for it and getting it for you? Um, and they are completely unrecognized and completely uncompensated and so um, There are so many places in almost that supply chain of delivery where we could be Organizing workers or disrupting the ways in which that is currently designed and where we could be reallocating that wealth um, that we're just we're not doing and a lot of those places sort of line up with all of the other histories of extraction um, and debasement um, brought on by capital um, and the, the this is a again a very very good pivot to this sort of question you know there's this tension right between the sort of uh, you know, technology not as a neutral medium, right? But as this expression of, sort of social relations, but also of, of limitations, right? Uh, we want to think dialectically, but we also have a kind of, e there's not just a both and, like a classic Hegel, there's also an either or, and some of that's coming up here. And this is where I think the, the low modernist vision, like I've, I'm curious to hear more of that and how that fits in this sort of weird tension. Yeah, um, yeah so the, um, the, I, so high modernism is the kind of, you know, very progress and science oriented, I guess, um, both ideology and set of projects that's like, you know, um, using technology and science to dominate nature is like a, the great human enterprise and we should do those as much as we can and so on. Um, 
I actually have some slides if people want to see more slides. <laughs> um, I'm going to stir up. So, and I think this has actually been, so, um, sorry, one sec. How do I enter? We don't use PowerPoint usually, so. Um, can I get that? Okay, great. So, like, I think in terms of, like, I mean, to the question of the state and what the state does, I think that when people think about using the state, it tends to be this very, like, okay, let's, yes. like, build the Hoover Dam. Let's do, like, I mean, or, like, the TVA, and this is, you know, this is from the um, TVA website. It's, like, built for the people, like, the big dam that's, like, the project that will use harness science and technology for, like, the service of um, the public in some way. Um, and I mean, I don't know if people saw this Rachel Maddow commercial on MSNBC, but where she's like in front of the Hoover Dam and like this is what it means um, to think about. Um, we have to <laughs> we have to figure out whether still a country that can think this big and like that's what using you know like the nation or the state or whatever it is is to like think big and build this gigantic like concrete thing. Um, and I think um, you know, so I'm trying to think about like, what other kinds of imaginaries we can have about like how to uh, use technology and the state, which I agree is necessary. Um, but like without just saying, okay, and so let's go out and dominate <laughs> um, and like, you know, build these huge things. And, you know, people have made criticisms, ecological criticisms of dams. Certainly uh, for a long time, there've been a ton of like ecological movements around dams um, or against dams and starting, people are starting to like take them down and so on. But I think there are also other, you know, these are obviously New Deal era projects, but they're not the only ones. And um, I actually get the term low modernism from uh, Jess Gilbert who wrote a book about, um, uh, what he calls like agrarian democracy and the Soil Conservation Service, which is one of the New Deal efforts to repair some of the harm done by agricultural overproduction um, and like post Dust Bowl uh, kind of ecological restoration. And there were different versions of it, but one of the things he's interested in is this uh, soil conservation district programs where they try to organize farmers um, and um, importantly, not just landowners, which a lot of other New Deal agricultural pro uh, programs were oriented towards, but tenant farmers as well, which was really important because. Um, uh, you know, um, like working class and especially black farmers were left out of a lot of landowner projects. <laughs> they did not own land. Um, but in collectively managing land within like a watershed or some kind of naturally bounded area rather than county lines um, and to try to do this as like a project that had, you know, like state employed experts, but also people who were working the land, working together to what he calls economic democracy and agriculture. And so it wasn't kind of just like the planners coming in and saying, all right, this is how it works, like get, you know, get with the program. Um, uh, and nor was it just kind of like the farmers know everything and so they can just do, you know, it was kind of trying to manage different kinds of knowledge and um, across, uh, um, within like an ecologically bounded space and so on. I think it's an interesting example. Um, I also think that there are other ways to, you know, I actually do think we are going to need some like big high modernist-esque stuff, um, but I think it should not be the only imaginary. And I think that when we think about it, it maybe could be applied to things like housing. So I think like the Barbican in London, um, I love it's, I don't know if people have been there or seen pictures of it, but it's this very like huge, like very modernist housing, like concrete, <laughs> brutalist, whatever housing project. But there's also like a big, you know, like, yeah, I, I love brutalism, I'm sorry, but like. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> But there's also, you know, there's like a lot of, there's tons of like, you know, parks and plants and there's like this big artificial lake and they have a bunch of, you know, there's tons of cultural programming. You can go see like a play and go see symphonies and you can have this whole, it's just a huge social project. It's very utopian. You're just like, oh, I can go here and do all of these kinds of, um, you know, uh, I think as all of us have talked about in some way, more like leisurely kinds of activities and it's using this big scale thing or like Vienna social housing has this like also very beautiful kind of green like modernist thing and so I think thinking about like how we can um, use I guess like uh, selectively use <laughs> high modernism and also try to like but more generally aim towards instead of just like high tech eco-socialism like low-key eco-socialism um, and uh, you know I always think of like the um, I know, you know, Marx's famous description of uh, communism and the German ideology, uh, where you go and you hunt in the morning and fish in the afternoon and rear cattle in the evening and criticize after dinner. Like, it's very, he's like interacting with other species and all of these. I mean, admittedly, he's trying to kill them uh, in a couple, but maybe we can update that and, you know, bird watch in the morning and snorkel in the afternoon. And he can still criticize after dinner, um, <laughs> as Marxists are want to do. Um, but uh, I don't know if people saw this, um, well, this is my favorite, uh, Meryl Laterman ukulele, who does maintenance art, but, um, and people saw the New York Times, like, spread of, like, pictures from the 70s of, like, people hanging out in parks in the 70s that they just rediscovered, but I really love them, because I think they're um, what uh, Daniel Cohen, who's in the audience here, calls low-carbon leisure. Um, yeah. 
And it's like very, and I think these are also very like low modernism technologies, like a boom box, a frisbee, like things where you can go out and have like a nice leisurely fun time um, and hang out with other people and um, have like the kind of good life within planetary boundaries we're talking about. This is also nice because you have the kind of like UFO-esque <laughs> like frisbee imagery. Anyway, um, so I, that's how I think about, I guess, trying to navigate these questions um, and like how and where we can um, use the state to, to do that, so. So, um, <laughs> Cool. Uh, so uh, questions. Uh, we'll take it. We'll take like in bunches. We'll take a, a couple of each, uh, around. Uh, do you want to? Thank you. This was a really uh, interesting set of talks. Uh, really enjoyed enjoyed all the talks. Um, my my question is, uh, you know, num number one um, to you, when you make this analogy between extraction in its physical material guise and the algorithmic virtual world uh, extraction. Um, I mean, there, there's a very important difference that uh, material goods are um, uh, rival goods, whereas um, virtual goods are non-rival goods. So we, if we extract something algorithmically, it doesn't take away from our uh, ability to extract something else or that same thing a second time or by someone else. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have thought about you know, the, the fact that we kind of um, uh, require some kind of compensation for our data, um, how th that would actually actually work in practice, given that you know, some other entity made, made up of perhaps a cooperative or a collective of ourselves might also be interested in um, extracting data for the common good um, as well. And, and my, my question to, um, to, to, to AJ was, um, um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, that this requirement that um, we have a planned, um, we plan for the future, number one, that comes, seems to come with an unstated assumption that our long-term survival as a species is important. But we, oh, yeah. that's a great I mean, we may not all agree on that. I mean, we might simply think that it is better to enjoy, burn the candle at both ends, and why should it matter? And maybe it it's occurs to me that perhaps the reason that this unstated assumption is there is because of the humanism you know, that underlies so much of Marx, that the human being is important and different and special in, in some sense. But it, it, it seems to me that you know, if, you, if, we are, if we are willing to mandate this kind of social control that we would have some kind of planning, and no matter what, you will be dragged kicking and screaming into complying with that plan, then why not simply um, uh, in, enforce you know, ma mandatory population control? I mean, if we are willing to tolerate that kind of authoritarianism, then we don't need to have seven million people jostling for space on the planet, and we can similarly mandate you know, uh, enforce reduction of population. So this question uh, is inspired by um, AJ having mentioned that um, the ecological crisis is in many respects also a crisis of gendered labor. And to the authors that were already cited in the presentation, I want to add Vandana Shiva, who is an Indian socialist feminist, and I would say also an ecological feminist, and um, my question in thinking about her is if all of you could say more about how you see gender as a part of the um, terrain that we're discussing here, the contradictions of gender and um, the potentials for um, a truly intersectional, truly global feminist movement and, and what that kind of socialist feminist ecology would look like. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has um, thoughts about the way your comments relate to um, the way that neoliberalism or whatever we want to call the contemporary condition subjectivizes individuals as them personally being responsible for 
for transforming the climate or stopping or you know leaving less of a carbon footprint. I'm thinking, for example, of recycling as something that really places the onus on the individual to um, to do better or you know to buy an electric car rather than a normal car. Um, but ra rather than talking about how um, these transformative policies and these huge um, e carbon footprints are actually not being left by in individuals, but by these gigantic companies that um, have much more of an impact on our on our environment. Yeah. So um, on the question around compensation for data, um, there's I kind of have two ways of thinking about it. There's the very specific current way that it could that we could imagine it, which is like why I start with the workplace, because there's a pre-existing economic relationship between the entity extracting the data and the person that is that is having the data taken from them. And then that, and that is to to claim some of the wealth generated, more of the wealth generated from their productivity. So like you use information that I deliver to you through the automated system that I use while I'm working and you gain more productivity from it. So I, I mean, this is very, it's like very basic. Um, but if we're looking in the long term, what I think is more interesting is, so data really actually only works in aggregate and as the commons. And so um, a lot of folks have talked quite a bit about how most of the giant tech platforms and tech monopolies are essentially municipal systems. They kind of function as public utilities. And so if you imagine a circumstance in which you're thinking about Google as a public utility, um, then the data is commonly owned and the aggregate value of the data goes back to the culture. Like you're able to use Google without the ads because the, the use of the data is going back into building a system that is commonly owned by all people, um, which I think is actually like in the short term, the individual claims on productivity from data is more of like setting up a mental framework um, for thinking differently about the fact that you are producing value through your participation in these systems, but it gets you to a long term imagining of like my participation creates value. In aggregate, it's even more valuable. Could we all be sharing in that um, at an aggregate level? Okay. Um, the second set of questions were uh, given to me, but I'm happy to share. <laughs> but uh, um, but I'll, I'll say quickly, um, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, the, there's in that sort of jargon that is both academic jargon and also sort of activist jargon, uh, I am centering humans. Um, you know, uh, this morning a little bit we talked about sort of humanism, anti-humanism, um, and I would say like I think part of this project for me is, is critical humanism, and it does privilege human survival. Um, and I'm like okay with that. There is a vast literature and there's a lot of people, um, and I think, and I'm not 100% dismissive of it because like maybe that, you know, that super grim thing to me is actually like the optimistic version because like most likely actually it's insoluble and we all die. But like, or not all of us, everyone but Rex Tillerson. But um, no, but like, like there is a large and interesting, and I, I'm not being trying to be dismissive of it, literature about like, yeah, like why bother? Like we maybe should be stoic about it and just kind of suck it up and die. Um, maybe we should, you know, the, 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 the coral reef and us are of equal weight and there's not really a lot of argument you can make against that and like why should we last and it not? Um, so like I, I will openly say there is a meta-ethical position here that privileges human survival. Um, and I don't know how to get, get around that. Um, that said, the mandatory population thing, I think is a, you know, it's funny, that I just saw that new Avengers movie, um, right? Like, it's, it, like there is like this kind, there is like a kind of super weird, it is a Baconian logic, and in addition to the Malthusian one. No, it's like, it's like, well, if we get rid of half of all the life everywhere, then people will be happier, right? Because there'll be more stuff to spread around. I mean, it seemed incredibly intuitive about it. Um, I think one of the things I was trying to get out with my little like cyborg circuit example is actually like that would just have the same stressors uh, on a smaller scale. So perhaps maybe the carbon stuff is a little bit down, but it's still pre pretty shit. Um, and the second point comes back to the critical humanism, which is I'm pretty sure that like 
this is not a heroic story. And I do think some people try to spin this as a heroic story where like, um, you know, this, it's sort of like the good version of Mad Max or something. And like the survival people are super awesome. But like I said, the survival people probably have like big, it's probably like the actual Mad Max thing. It's like big private armies on resource hoarding, um, which is kind of already what it is. But if people read Octavia Butler books, you know, like the world is just kind of Octavia Butler books. Like it's, it's, like, and that's not great. And that's already, that's not like it's the future world. That's the now. Um, the, yeah. The last two were the sort of e ecology and gender, which I'm happy to answer, but probably one of you should answer, and neoliberalism. Yeah, go. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually, I think, a good, I mean, that, the, the population question is a great segue into the gender question, because yeah. I think this is the way that, like, so, I mean, I, I think of gender as being very essential to the way I think about um, eco, like, ecological, political economy, and so on, and, um, you know, you see this in um, a number of people, like Maria Mies and Jason Moore, and people have made these um, uh, arguments that are that are like saying that both the unwaged work of, of households and of many kinds of women's work are also or social reproduction is also um, is analogous to ecological reproduction and I, I use a very similar framework um, and I think you know Vandana Shiva has written things with Maria Mies and they're in a in a similar place um, and I'll say something I guess um, something about Shiva in a minute but um, I do find it always sort of depressing that the way that um, these kinds of you know instead of like reproducers of the world unite you get this kind of like uh, the way to solve like the ecological regeneration crisis is to like limit reproductive freedoms and to you know you have to pit the reproducers against each other instead of figuring out the like social ecological reproductive um, future that we would I think have all described in various ways wanting to live in and so um, you know I, I, I'm trying to understand more about this like and it, you know you can see it kind of happening in the 70s when both of these like um, discourses are emerging and said so you get like Garrett Hardin who's whose entire argument about um, the tragedy of the commons is about how the welfare state licenses over over uh, you know um, too much reproduction and uh, doesn't just like you know people aren't limited to whatever children they can support and uh, Garrett Hardin, the tragedy, he wrote the, um, you know, if you've heard the tragedy of the commons phrase, like he popularized this phrase, and the article is really, it's really atrocious, um, <laughs> both ideologically and like as a piece of social science, it's just like half of it is made up, and, um, but he's, you know, he's, he's really explicitly um, saying that the, uh, that, you know, the welfare state is, is the reason for, um, for overpopulation and so on. Um, but so I think you see, and you see this coming out in various ways, and it's really, um, I find it depressing, so I would like to figure out how, like, contemporary socialists and communists and Marxists can figure out how to um, not repeat that. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the personal responsibility, well, I guess I'll say one brief thing about Shiva, which is that I, I think she's done really amazing work to often remind us of the, um, the ways that, like, you know, things like biotech and so on can be sites of, um, you know, renewed primitive accumulation and so on, and the ways that, like, Monsanto's um, seed control can dispossess Indian peasants of, like, their livelihoods and so on. Um, I do think sometimes she can shade a bit into, like, you know, a more anti-technology stance than I would personally like. I, you know, tend to fall with Donna Haraway on these things, and my cyborgs for earthly survival pin, which is forever my slogan. Um, <laughs> I also like to become these beings of the biosphere unite, so we can maybe figure out a new one. But um, you know, so that's so. I think we should just try to keep that in mind. And um, on the personal responsibility, I mean, I do think there's both the question of um, you know thinking about collective consumption rather than just individualizing it, and that's very important. Um, and that you know con consumption and production are you cannot think about separately, and it's uh, we can't just say like well consumers, especially given that like the American um, consumer household was like created to absorb production, <laughs> and then it's like oh consumers, why are you consuming so much? It's like really maddening. Um, but I think there's also some things that make me nervous in reading some of the ecological literature. I mean, if you read, you know, I don't know if people have read Barry Commoner, but um, you know. A, I think it like wrote about um, was writing about ecology from a left perspective in the 70s and he has his four laws of ecology and one of them is no such thing as a free lunch um, which he admits he takes from economics um, and you know it's, it's supposed to describe this this problem that you're mentioning that there's no you can't just like come up with more cadmium from somewhere and it's, it's right in many ways but I think the ways that it's like also a neoliberal slogan that like you can't get something for nothing there's no like free stuff like all of this has like become transmuted into the language of like you can't have free public goods because someone's paying for them and it's like oh, rich people. Grow on trees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, totally. So I think we need to figure out, I don't know, maybe we need some new language around this, but I think there's, this, there's been a blurring of this kind of like, we need to account for all the costs, which I think is right, and capitalism can't actually account for all its costs and be profitable. But like that's become, instead of a, a way to hold capital to account, become like a, a way to like discipline individual um, people as consumers and um, you know, who are trying to get about their lives. So I, I, I would like to, you know, I'm still thinking through this myself, but I'm, I think that's a really crucial thing for us to do. Yeah, um, yeah. just briefly, I mean, to, to hop onto that, I think there's a real language of austerity that kind of pervades um, many different parts of the climate debate. Um, and, and, you know, this comes from like everything from like bike more to work, you know, these, these sort of like individual lifestyle choices, which are um, great, you know, it might make your life better if you bike more to work. Will it have a like world historic impact on um, parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere? Probably not. Um, and that's, I think it's, it's hard to, I think it's hard to sort of decouple that from um, just the way that like neoliberalism has so sort of totally um, captured the policy debate in particular on climate change. Um, and really sort of, you know, it, it's interesting to look at sort of like the development of the, of the green movement, right? And that um, the 70s sort of, you know, you had these activist lawyers going out and like suing states um, to like protect these like obscure bird species um, and then protect like by doing that, protect like huge swaths of land um, and really doing this like really interesting like activist lawyer work, which was making claims of the state, right? Um, which is making these really interesting um, things. And, and, you know, the Clean Air Act comes out of that, the Clean Water Act comes out of that. Um, these really powerful laws that actually today give us a lot of power to regulate carbon um, and, and have, you know, yeah, have given us this really powerful regulatory framework. Um, and that sort of starts to fade away as neoliberalism rises. Um, and so, you know, you have people who are like members of the Mont Pelerin Society in the 1970s talking about how we should be taxing pollution. Um, and then that has just become sort of common logic among even people like Bernie Sanders, right? Around like yeah. even, yeah, even sort of like center left figures. And there's nothing, you know, I think a carbon tax is a good idea. I think it should happen. It's common sense. Um, but there's a way in which like the, um, the sort of neoliberal project, which, you know, is multifaceted. There are many different parts to it. But I think a really, you know, maybe the, the, the through line of it is that the market is sort of all knowing, that the market um, is the best, um, uh, the best means of assessing information, of processing information, and of, of, of giving people, um, you know, the, the, the information for how to live their lives. Um, and that has just totally captured the climate debate and I think has gone um, a little bit unquestioned in part because of how far the climate debate has been from the left historically and that a lot of folks in the Green Movement don't necessarily, you know, have the language to talk about that. And so, yeah, you get these very, um, these, these very sort of neoliberal solutions um, that to talk to, uh, you know, like policymakers about this stuff. And I've interviewed, you know, folks who I think are, are, are very well intentioned, but there's just the, the, the um, realm of imagination is just so small um, in terms of what they can think about. And that's for a lot of reasons, um, in part because of these, you know, really specific ways that um, neoliberalism, neoliberalism has shaped um, our conversation about economic policy. Um, but um, yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't think it's, it's necessarily anyone's, f well, it's, it's like, you know, neoliberalism and, and capitalism's fault, right? Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily blame um, policymakers in the here and now for um, working with a very limited set of tools when there really has not been very much on the table. Um, and the intellectual infrastructure around um, climate thought in particular is just so weak and that there just are very few think tanks or very few sort of people writing white papers um, for what a holistic transformation away from, um, away from uh, fossil fuels will look like. Um, and the people who are writing those papers are like in the American Enterprise Institute and in like Brookings and in these sort of like center right institutions um, who, you know, AEI has been writing papers about climate change since for like 15 years and writing about geoengineering for like, you know, years and years and years. Um, and I think the left sort of policy infrastructure is not quite caught up to that. And so what we get is this sort of, you know, everything from individual to um, just rote market-based um, solutions. Yeah, um, just super quick. Uh, on the sort of 
ecology, gender. I mean, it, this came up last night, right? Like, the, and I, I think, and we've come up a few times here. Like, you can't just sort of staple things on together. Uh, and sometimes the way in which gender is discussed in Marxian conversations is like, oh, there's also social reproduction. Uh, and there's a way in which um, the the cl the climate conversation is like social reproduction is the primary thing. <laughs> like the other forms of production are part of social reproduction, not the not vice versa. So that's just a qu quick one on there. Um, the question about uh, in consumption choices, uh, which is in fact the way and individual behaviors. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not scared of the n-word neoliberalism. There's other n-words. Um, uh, some there's like this popular now insane discourse that this doesn't mean anything. Uh, you should really like people who believe that this word doesn't mean anything should tell the IMF because they use it in their working papers all the time. Um, and part of the way in which it says is, right, we sort our meaningful choices through market mechanisms. Um, and of course, uh, the climate sort of lens uh, of climates, but this is true for like basically everything, um, is very illuminating on this, on, this, on this example because there's, uh, is, I always get in trouble when I say this, but I'll totally fucking say it. There's not, your consumption choices have no political significance whatsoever. Um, if you maybe join a boycott movement, if you join a cooperative uh, 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 distribution movement, if like something, you can make it, you can amplify these things. But like when you go to a store and choose to buy one thing or another, it has no political meaning. It might make you feel good. And I actually believe in people feeling good. That's why like, I'm actually scared of the sort of aesthetic side of the, of the climate story. Um, and maybe making you feel good gets you to do other stuff. But in the end, the story that those things are political is just untrue. Uh, uh, more questions, yeah. I have a couple of targeted questions. So the first one is for Kate. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Venezuela and like maybe how the social welfare policies that they had were based and linked to the Petro state. And so like maybe is there, are there any lessons there about welfare and like how do you have left these policies? Maybe if there is anything that you know about it or how it can be linked to them. No, okay. <laughs> And then for AJ, um, you mentioned climate displacement, and I wonder if you could expand on that. And you mentioned climate displacement, and if you could expand on maybe like that, that, that seems to be a burden that has to be carried by the global south and not so. So last night we had a really interesting conversation about forgetting and the work of capitalism in forcing forgetting. And um, listening to y'all talk especially about what a good low carbon life might be, I've been thinking about how um, the teachers movement is a way in which women are doing both the work of challenging petro-driven austerity in those particular states and doing the socially reproductive work of remembering and driving that conversation. And so I wondered um, if you could think some about that. Um, I would like maybe comment, maybe uh, somehow to make it a question um, about these utopian ecological buildings. It's do we account for all consequences that we choose, which species, which um, uh, um, uh, trees, what, what actually we choose. For example, um, um, there is, uh, right now we have this um, epidemic um, with Lyme disease. The um, uh, cause is only one. We choose um, deers over wolves because, uh, unfortunately, um, nature is brutal. Nature is unfair, and six, six, uh, deer who has disease has to die as soon as possible. But um, evolution uh, created this balance for million years, and we like for two years building these buildings, choosing trees, then we don't have any flies, any frogs, anything, and we 
kind of don't really think about what kind of consequences all these utopian buildings would produce. Hi, I am like sort of like two questions. They're sort of connected. The first question is, um, what is the left or um, response to um, obviously the ecological crisis? It's going to cause a huge existential crisis for the concept of a nation state. So, do we have an answer for something like this? And second, uh, you mentioned you know the dire issue of um, our ecological problem and. Um, how it's also related to technology. We do have the capacity to solve some of these issues with the technology, as you said, but because it's not profitable, um, we don't implement it. Um, so how do we get around this um, when we have to, like, when we're thinking about intellectual property rights, um, patents and stuff, how are we able to um, get around this? And is there a compromise for people that are innovative and creative on trying to figure out a way that works out for like the entire society and um, being able to at least uh, get value for our labor. Uh, who's taking what? Is anyone taking Venezuela? Okay. I would just say I don't I don't know very much about Venezuela, so I'll not get myself into trouble or just like drawn on about things I, I can't speak to. So I, I wish I did. Um, I will say that you know the thread that I think is um, maybe true there, from what I understand of it, um, and has been present in um, in in the teacher strikes that I was talking about and sort of resource heavy states, um, is that tying um, an economy, um, you know, good or bad, um, one that you know is, is fairly redistributive or one that is not very redistributive um, to a fuel source, which is inherently um, incredibly volatile, um, like oil, is just I, I think you know has been proven over and over again not to make very much sense. Um, and so as, that, as those fuel sources are set to um, sunset, hopefully um, that, that, that will make less and less sense. And so you know, just to um, reiterate what I said before, that uh, we really need to think of new ways to, um, to, to for, for new funding sources for a robust um, safety net. Um, in terms of um, the, role of, the role of women um, in sort of challenging sort of petro-driven Austerity. Um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the protagonists of these fights have been um, have been women. Almost, you know, not not entirely. Certainly, there are. It's not only women who are teachers, um, but it is a predominantly female workforce. Um, and I think that's you know, I I I, I think Alyssa has probably done more work on on this kind of front than than I can um, speak to too well. Um, but I think there is sort of a new. Um, vision really being crafted, and I think what's interesting about it is it's sort of a new, um, a new idea of like what a green job entails, right? It's mm -hmm. like a, we think of a green job as like being like hoisting wind turbines or like putting solar panels or these like huge infrastructure projects. Um, but there are plenty of jobs like, like teaching, um, which are not carbon intensive um, and are um, really good for the planet, I think encourage a really different way of thinking about, um, thinking about what valuable work entails um, and I think you know sometimes the conversation about like you know the conversation about like the job guarantee for instance is, has orbited around like what is like really productive work um, look like and you know that could be like public archiving that could be like um, you know something like the, the uh, federal theater project as part of the WPA it's like you know give people jobs like writing plays or like acting in plays um, there was some um, there was some, you know, uh, uh, oversight hearing um, for WA pro WPA projects in New York, um, where um, one of the people who was like really critical of it was like, "Well, you're like doing these like, you're creating an archive of like a Jewish encyclopedia." It's like, "Well, wow, that's great work, you know." And and there, there are all these things that like were considered really unproductive, um, but that are, you know, as we're thinking about it today, low carbon, um, low carbon work and, and sort of expanding their range. Like people don't need to be producing widgets in order to have jobs. Like people can be paid to do um, all kinds of work, which is like socially remunerative and like can, can make people's lives better. Um, and so I think, you know, what what 
the teachers, I think, are showing us is that, you know, there, there is really valuable work and sort of looking toward um, that and maybe, you know, thinking of, thinking of striking teachers as a low carbon protagonist, um, to borrow from, from uh, my friend Daniel Cohen's um, work on that front. Um, and in terms of, just quickly, um, nation states, I think, um, Borders are, are the thing that comes to mind in there and sort of challenging how climate change um, challenges us to think about, think about nation states. Um, we will you know, really need to change the way we think about immigration um, and, 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 and you know, having that be, those two conversations are not separate conversations. They haven't been historically and you know, more, um, uh, more people are going to be sort of crossing borders um, than have at any point in human history um, as a result of climate change. And so I think like having, having you know, whether that's open borders, however we want to think about it, but there needs to be a radically different conversation about um, what, what border security um, looks like and what borders themselves do. Yeah. Um, the displacement question, which is a, the perfect uh, follow up to that, because um, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's going to be these tremendous, there have to be, and there will be tremendous challenges to the sort of nation state model. Um, and you know, in the same way that Kate was talking about, you know, the and American Enterprise Institute is like way out ahead on this, like in terms of like writing papers on it. Um, you know, we talked this morning ever so slightly a bit about the EU, um, right? Like, and people will rail at the EU and complain about the EU, and they rightly should. Um, the left doesn't like to talk about what its version, like, I mean, I know Yanni Sparapaki says his one thing that no one else believes in, but like, like, we don't like to talk about what our in international framework uh, with existing states would look like. Um, I mean, uh, my personal suspicion on this, especially on the displacement question, is both like, a, there are going to be, like, it's, it's, it's basically a foregone conclusion at this point. There are certain places on Earth that are currently uh, quite uh, socially important and also quite populated. So Pakistan is a very good example. Um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula is another really interesting example of this, uh, a place that probably within our lifetimes it will be very difficult to walk around in. Think about what that means for uh, a billion-something Muslims in the world. Um, but that uh, we'll probably need... Uh, a, a, the sort of a, a vague international framework that might start to think about from a more left perspective might be something like a greater mobility, uh, if not entirely, and I actually would be for complete free mobility, um, and greater controls and greater planning, again, I know it's a dirty word, on uh, where capital is moving, right? Because part of this story, right, um, if we decrease our consumption choices magically or something like this, and which actually has happened in certain parts of Europe, it just pops up in Bangladesh, in China, in other places. Um, and I do think that will be an existential crisis, as someone said back there, um, but I think it's one that it, I'm not scared of that crisis. Um, I think the right will use it as a, as a weapon of nationalism, and that's why we must articulate a better vision. Um, the only other thing I'll say on this, because I, I feel like you should dig the, the utopian buildings, because that's 100%. Um, the site of historical memory uh, being a gendered site uh, for the teacher strike is totally fascinating. Um, and actually, you know more about it than I do. Um, but right, uh, there was this, uh, one of you might know this even better than I do, right? The, the, the bandana yeah, symbol? The red yeah, yeah the, the red bandanas that the women in West Virginia wore were from the um, early mine wars back at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, which, by the way, I only know about, even though I grew up there, because my grandma told me about them, and not because I learned them in school, because we weren't allowed to learn them in school. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, uh, it was a, a, a really direct recall to what was happening um, in most of the, the first counties that went out on strike in the West Virginia teacher strike were the southern counties like Logan and um, Mingo and McDowell, and those were also the sites where um, the uprisings took place in the early 1900s, and so it was a direct call back to that. While I have the mic, if I can talk about forgetting, um, I loved that question a lot, and I, um, uh, it, it also, West Virginia related, made me think about like, um, a couple years ago, there was an article in the New York Times by this woman, Annie Lowry, who 
had gone to, I think she went to visit like McDowell or one of our, our southern counties and um, it seemed kind of bleak there and so she was like, shouldn't the government just pay everyone to leave because they could go get jobs other places? And there were a lot of us that were enraged at that suggestion because it was essentially an act of forgetting. Like, well, the place is done, so like you should just like, and of course the only important thing you can do is work. And so like, and, and a, lot, a lot of discussion took place among like Appalachians and Appalachian diaspora people about like, the value in people staying to hang on to a culture that existed and that if you leave you are essentially letting the coal companies ultimately win because you're leaving behind that culture and also a lot of times when I've worked um, at home when we talk about sustainability efforts or um, reclaiming land it is often talking it's, it's spoken in the language of reclaiming the old ways like and so the like the use of memory and the refusal to forget or, or sort of ancestral practices is actually directly connected to thinking about the value of a mountain versus the value value of a job when you're forced to do that because often your grandparents are buried there so anyway I, I just like I, I definitely agree that capital relies on forgetting and that there are all of these ways in which we see um, the value of cultural memory to preserve things coming up and it's actually quite a natural urge for people um, that tends to come into a lot of movement building work that we do. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the utopia buildings, et cetera, question in one second. Just have one short thing to add to this. I mean, I completely agree with everything um, you've all said about uh, the, the work of remembering and um, how exciting it is to see um, a new kind of labor movement recalling the history of the old. Um, and, you know, I think that's really great. I think it's like, how can we both think of that as like a remembering and a re-futuring or future visioning or something? And like, you know, we don't have to just give coal miners jobs as like solar panel techs. We can give them jobs as teachers <laughs> or like as nurses working to like, you know, for, I don't know, to heal people's black lung disease. And, you know, there's like a lot of things like that to do. Um, uh, I think always of like uh, the, you know, so like the Civilian Conservation Corps is one of the kind of also like park building things of the New Deal jobs programs where they, you know, build all these sort of national parks and things. But national parks also have like, his, there's there are historical national parks. Like you could do a like, uh, a, like a monuments to labor and the land, whatever. Like you can do these kinds of, you know, things that are remembering like the very rich history of, of, um, of political struggle in this country. Um, so I think there are a lot of, of exciting potential things there, but I think it's been very, and I think, I mean, even just remembering how many people are already doing this work, like the pictures people saw, I don't know if people saw those pictures from Arizona where all of the teachers were out like in the streets and it was, this humongous wave of red of teachers wearing, you know, their their red shirts and like out in the streets, and you're like, this is this is not like a like side, <laughs> you know, thing. This is, you know, there are a lot of people doing this work, and we should pay attention to that. So, um, but onto the question of, you know, what to, um, I guess the consequences unintended. I guess I guess I took there to being a few different questions, and those are concerns you have about, I guess, like the consequences of sort of trying to. Um, make ecological choices and what kinds of unintended consequences there are. And I think maybe there are a couple of different things going on there. And one is around, I guess, like the utopian buildings of things like the Barbican or something, where certainly, you know, I think in those people are, somebody is selecting like what trees are we planting and like what is this, you know, kind of created landscape and so on. And I think, um, you know, the more that that reflects the, what the people who are going to be living there would like to live around, the better that would be. And I think some of the sort of like, you know, the, the planning, like democratic agriculture, uh, agrarianism in this like low modernism uh, book I was mentioning, I think is actually an interesting way to think about some of that. But, but that's, I think, a slightly different thing than the, the question of, of thinking of doing that on a planetary scale in terms of global ecology, right? So like there's one that's, okay, building things. And, and you know, anything we build is going to have an environmental impact. I think there's no way around that. And it's important to recognize that, but not expect that there can be a, you know, you're not going to build like a big housing project and have it be like, impact free or something and I think that it's important to recognize that and think about what those are and, and be conscious of the choices we're making because we are always are making choices about how we are affecting um, you know the planetary ecology in which we live and if you look around the like 
that is already going haywire. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, there are like Lyme disease is spreading because of the warming of the planet. Species are moving as like the, the temperature boundary in which they can live is moving. Um, and that's been happening, bef you know, it's not only related to climate change, it's also related to the global economy and the, you know, like uh, species are, are, you know, stowaways on ships and so on. But like there, there are, um, there have been, I mean, this is often described as invasive species, which is a controversial term because it's like, where are species supposed to only belong in one place? Who knows? But they, but they have certainly moved outside of the, the places that they usually live because of, um, you know, global trade um, and the, the like material infrastructure and, and movement that goes along with that. And so I don't think that we can avoid thinking about these things. Like we do not live in a world, you know, we, we have to be, I think, already conscious of that. Um, the first, actually, the first economist uh, hired by the U.S. government was an economic ornithologist, um, oh, which was uh, economic ornithology is, uh, you know, basically studying birds according to whether, um, I mean, they, they call it like, you know, according to like monetary uh, values, but it's like basically whether, whether birds are good or bad for the economy. Um, and, and, <laughs> and really in the history of like, you know, Amer certainly an American um, I guess, environmental resource policy, whatever, it's always been about um, oriented towards like what kinds of production you are concerned with. So like, do you kill all the wolves because they're, um, you know, killing the cattle and, and cattle ranchers are upset about that? Or are you killing certain kinds of birds because they're eating one farmer's crops versus another kind of bird because they're helpful for, you know, so there, there are always these questions. And so far we've mostly made them on the basis of like trying to promote different kinds of industry or something, um, uh, often with quite, um, disastrous uh, ecological effects. And so, um, you know, this has been the history of, of and, there, and you know, there are always choices to make. Um, and I think some of the, like, there's sometimes, a, a, in, in thinking about the ethical dimension of whether we value humans above other species, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it is unvo unavoidable on some level um, to have to make some kinds of decisions if, you know, that like, yes, maybe we don't want people to have Lyme disease, maybe you eradicate like, you know, or like you're trying to like not have as much um, like ticks carrying Lyme disease and like I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but uh, so, you know, I think these are all like important ethical and political questions that we need to be thinking about seriously. Um, and so I guess that's what I would say about that. Um, just super, super cool quick on some of the, I think, might tie a couple of these things together. Um, and it actually weirdly brings us back to Marx. Um, that question of the, like, the, something that can seem so immaterial, right? The historical transmission of memory. Where is the site of memory? Um, a, that is, of course, a material process. Um, B, um, you were talking about, like, uh, Tim Mitchell's arguments about sort of development of a sort of coal miner subjectivity, and it's not terribly dissimilar from the way in which Marx talks about it uh, in sort of factory conditions, or Engels talks about it in factory conditions. In that story, where it's historical memory doing the work, as opposed to like being shoved into a room or into a like crevasse in a thing, uh, we can think about perhaps other ways in which these political subjects can be formed, um, which we might need uh, because you know, historically that thing that Marx calls a proletariat has never actually been a global majority uh, in any particular country or worldwide. Um, and then. Just the last thing I was thinking of, uh, I can't remember who said it, someone on this panel said, um, capitalism can't account for its own costs. And if there's one thing that I would wanna like sort of leave on the table for people to think about um, is that like leaving, you know, capitals volume one through three like on the table, like forgetting that for a moment, like everything, you know, some of the books that we've talked about, some of the articles we've talked about, some of the things, use the own Use like mainstream macroeconomic principles. Use arguments from liberal democratic theory. Use arguments from the inside, which is a classic Marxian right uh, position. It's imminent critique. It capitalism cannot, of its own accord, account for its own costs. And I think that's yeah. Uh, I don't know what else to say. We are at uh, so we're going to take a quick uh, coffee break. Um, and then the next panel after this is uh, at 4 p.m. is the Poetics and Aesthetics of Marx. And so we'll see you back here in a couple minutes. Uh, thank you so much to you all for participating. And thank you guys for listening. <laughs>